Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we well, thank you for a leadership development meeting tonight. We're asking, Lord, that you speak to every heart and you open our eyes of understanding so we understand the scriptures in Jesus' name. Amen. We're asking, Lord, that your word will have effect in every heart, every life, every leader in Jesus' name. Amen. And we'll go in the spirit of the word, the passion of the word, and the fire, the revival you kindle in our hearts because of the word. And we'll do your will and bring many to the kingdom and keep your children in the kingdom by your grace, your strength, your power, enablement in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight we come to Revelation chapter 15. Our reading from verse 1. Revelation chapter 15 verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Verse 7. In verse 7, it says, And one of the four bees gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who would live forever and ever. In verse 1, it talks about the wrath of God. In verse 7, it talks about the wrath of God. And then in verse 2, it tells us about the people that will escape the wrath of God at that time. Look at verse 2. It says, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast. Those are the people who are going to escape the wrath of God to come at the time of the great tribulation. They had had the victory. They received the victory. They were triumphant over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. And now they are able to stand on the sea of glass having the halves of God in their hands. They are able to praise the Lord, glorify the Lord because he rescued them, because he saved them, because they escaped the wrath of God at the time of the great tribulation. And even today, the wrath of God is poured out upon humanity, upon individuals and upon communities because of the evil in their hands. And yet there are people who are able to escape because we have the victory over the beast. We have the victory over the spirit of the Antichrist, the mystery of iniquity, which is already working even today. Tonight, we're speaking on the subject, believers sure escape from the final wrath. Believers show escape from the final wrath. We're looking at it under three perspectives. Number one, the great revelation of the wrath of God. The great revelation of the wrath of God. There are believers, there may be Christian leaders and Christian workers or preachers, pastors, who do not understand the revelation of the wrath of God. And they might transfer all the wrath of God into the future. In the future, they say, we know the great revelation is coming. There's going to be the wrath of God. And eventually, the wrath to come. That is when everything, the timetable of God is finished on earth. And then there will be the wrath of God in eternity. They do not understand from the beginning of time. From the time of Noah, the wrath of God. That's what brought the flood. 
and Sodom and Gomorrah. That's why they were destroyed with fire. Is the wrath of God. And those uh, people that have offended God or they have been adamant in sin from that Genesis time until the time in which we're living now, there is the wrath of God. So we need to understand, number one, the great revelation of the wrath of God. Number two, is the glorious redemption and the glorious rescue from the wrath of God. Even from the beginning of times, there were people that escaped. Enoch escaped that wrath of God. And then we know of the children of Israel when the angel of doom and the angel of destruction and the angel of death appeared in Egypt. There were those that had the mark of the blood of the Lamb upon the lintels of their houses and they escaped the wrath of of God in the wilderness when the wrath of God came upon the rebellious and disobedient there were people like Caleb and Joshua and Moses and the rest of them that escaped the wrath of God there is a redemption there is a rescue of the from the wrath of God the glorious redemption from the wrath of God and then number three is the gracious reversal the gracious reversal of the wrath of God what that means is the wrath is coming the wrath is coming and then all of a sudden somebody says I know the wrath will meet me here if I don't move if I don't turn around if I don't uh, do something about it the wrath is coming at a great speed and that's what Jonah was telling the people of Nineveh and he said yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown totally destroyed the word came to the king and the word came to all the people of Nineveh and then the king said we can do something we must do something let everyone repent and turn away from the evil and the violence in their hands who can tell if the wrath that is prophesied and predicted if everything will be reversed so that we do not perish and then God saw their works that they repented and they turned from their evil ways and then he changed his mind and the wrath did not come upon them anymore as it was with them so it is with everyone because God is not a respecter of persons if we will turn if we will return if we will repent if we will turn around and say I'm not going to allow that wrath of God to meet me here at the point of rebellion disobedience and evil and then we step aside the wrath of God will be reversed and the wrath of God will not come upon any of us as we take the step to please the Lord in Jesus name I was waiting for your amen. amen point number three then is the gracious reversal of the wrath of God let's come to number one in number one we're looking at the great revelation of the wrath of God why does the wrath of God come upon humanity upon any community haven't they told us as in the word of God said that God is love how can the God of love allow his law to fall on anyone we must understand that God is love but God is also holy and the angels shout and the angels sing holy 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 unto the is the Lord God Almighty because of his holiness he cannot abide he cannot stay he cannot approve of sin anytime sin comes in that means the people decide on their own to follow Satan to follow the devil and the wrath that have been appointed a portion for Satan must come upon them who are servants of uh, Satan that's why you have uh, the wrath of God three things here number one the reasons for the wrath of God the reasons for God's wrath number two the retribution 
that is somebody sows the wind is going to reap the wild wind somebody sows evil and iniquity is going to reap is going to reap also in, in indignation the wrath of god that's the reason why and that's why you have the retribution in god's wrath number three the recipients of god's wrath the people who wage and the people who say i don't care what god is going to do i don't care what is going to happen this is what i'm going to do and i'm going to continue like this they are the recipients of god's wrath let's look at them one by one number one the reasons for god's wrath it tells us in ephesians chapter 5 Ephesians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 5. Ephesians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 5. It says, For this ye know that no monger, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. You will notice that all those groups of people mentioned in that verse 5, they are opposed to God. They are enemies of God. They rebel against God. All mongers are unclean. And he said, every unclean person, every covetous man, an idolater who gives himself or gives the heart to a material thing and is holding on to that thing, he wants to worship that created thing more than he worships God. They do not have any inheritance in the kingdom of God or in the kingdom of Christ. It says in verse 6, in verse 6, let no man man deceive you let no eternal security preacher false prophet false teacher deceive you don't let anyone deceive you and say once you are saved you are saved forever even if you are a monger even if you are covetous even if you are an idolater even if you are an unclean person even if your life is defiled from inside to outside and they say you are all right no you will not be all right let no man deceive you with vain words with foolish doctrine and with false doctrine for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Those who rebel against God, disobey the word of God, and they leave the path of righteousness, and they leave the path of holiness, it says the wrath of God comes upon them, children of disobedience. That's the reason why it's not because God predestined anybody to have the wrath of God. It's not because God has said, whatever you do, I'm going to bring my wrath upon you. It's a God of love. And it's a merciful God. It's because people rebel and they remain in that disobedience. That's why eventually the wrath of God comes upon them. It tells us in Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 18, in Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, against all unrighteousness of man, of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. There are people that have even been taught the truth. They have learned the truth. They have read the truth. They have read the Bible. And they even follow a method of reading the Bible. They might say, I read the Bible through every year, every two years. But then all the truths they learn, they hold that in an unrighteous heart. All that they read will not convert them. All they study will not convert them. They're holding the truth of God. They're holding sound doctrine. They can tell about salvation. They can tell about sanctification. They can tell about the Holy Ghost, immersion, baptism in the Holy Ghost. But it's only talk of mouth. It doesn't reflect in their lives. They behave with the old nature. They act with the old nature. They live in the old dungeon and darkness of the devil that they have ever lived. All 
all the study is in the head it doesn't come to the heart they are holding the truth in unrighteousness and the wrath of God will be revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they, they have the knowledge of God and they have the requirements of God and the demands of God, but they drop it in the church where they go when they hear the preaching and when they go back home between them and their wives, between them and their children, they are as brutal, as cruel, as evil, as oppressive, as if they never heard the word of God. They do not like to retain the knowledge of God in their mind, in their heart. When they come to church, they hear the word of God and then they go to their offices and they they are as corrupt as anybody in the office there they take bribe they demand bribe and they have all these uh, cake bags and that's how they live their lives and yet dutifully they will come on meeting days and come to church but they do not like to retain God in their knowledge because of that God gave them over to a reprobate mind that's the way you want to live all right, go ahead, I'll meet you on the judgment day. He gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. What were they doing that were not convenient? What are they doing that anybody who is on the way to heaven will feel the discomfort and will feel the inconvenience that how could that happen? It's like when you are going on the road and you see a terrible accident, it's inconvenient and it shocks you and all, all, the, all the part of you will shudder inside you. What is it the people are doing that God makes them, uh, you know, the firewood of his eternal fire? And it says what they're doing is not convenient and uh, they're going to experience the wrath of God. Look at verse 29. In verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, they're storing it up. You saw them uh, maybe last month, you saw a kind of unrighteousness in their lives. By the time you see them one month after, they have got more inventions of unrighteousness, attitude of unrighteousness, actions of unrighteousness. And it's like anywhere they see anybody misbehaving or having acts of disobedience, they get that. I didn't know I could, you know, also do that. And then uh, they are storing them up until they are filled with all unrighteousness. Fornication is there wickedness is there covetousness is there maliciousness is there they are full of envy and murder and debate and deceit malignity whisperers in verse 30 it tells us but but biters and those are the people that stab their friends at the back they stab fellow members of the church at the back they say thieves that if the person they are saying that thing about if he hears he will say what how can you invent such a big lie how can you invent such a big slander against me but that's who they are and that's why the wrath of god is coming upon them they are haters of god they are despiteful they despise the things that are good and they despise the people that are good and they despise the word of god and because of that despising that's the reason for the wrath of god coming upon them they are inventors of evil things even things that you know other sinners do not practice other sinners do not know about they will invent it's like all the time as other people are making research and they are inventing good things we can use to make progress on earth they are making their research and they are inventing evil things bad behavior 
what they have never seen in others, they invent bad action, what they have, they have never seen in others, they invent. That's the reason why the wrath of God comes upon them and then it says they are disobedient to parents, they are disobedient to their natural parents, they are disobedient to their spiritual parents. Disobedience is the mark and the hallmark of their lives. It says in verse 31, in verse 31, they are without understanding, they are covenant breakers, they are without natural affection. That is, even those who are not born again, those who act by nature, there are some natural things they do that will show that they have the milk of love, the milk of affection, but they, the milk of affection, the natural milk is totally dried up and they are without natural affection implacable implacable if they are hurting you and they are doing something and you try to bend and you try to yield and you try to plead no they are implacable they have made up their minds that the work of destruction they are going to do and the path of destruction they are going to follow and no matter how you pray no matter how you fast no matter how you appeal they are implacable and they are unmerciful. That's the reason why the wrath of God is coming upon them. In verse 32 it says, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things, all of them, all of them no ex exception, God is no respecter of persons who commit such things when which, which commit such things are worthy of death not only do the same but have pleasure in them that do them those are the people that uh, encourage backsliders to remain in their backsliding those are the people that encourage and strengthen sinners to remain in their sins. They hear that the wrath of God is coming. They hear that the judgment of God is coming. But all the same, they do evil themselves and they bring the wrath of God upon themselves. And also they encourage other people to do the same evil thing, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things and and worthy of the judgment of God of death, not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. Let's come to number two there. Number two is the retribution in God's wrath. The retribution in God's wrath. We're looking at Revelation chapter 15, verses 6 and 7. Revelation chapter 15, we're looking at verse 6. It tells us in verse 6, And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, having their breasts, their chest guarded with golden girdles. And then in verse 7, it says in verse 7, And one of the four bees, one of the living creatures, gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God full of the wrath of God who liveth and forever and ever but why why should that wrath of God come upon people in any generation at any time look at Revelation chapter 11 verse 18 Revelation chapter 11 reading from verse 18 and the nations were angry and thy wrath is come. Can you imagine the creature angry against the creator? Can you imagine a natural person angry against the supernatural person? Can you imagine a limited man is angry against our limited God? The nations were angry and thy wrath is come and the time of the dead that they should be judged wrath, wrath of God comes at the time of judgment when judgment comes upon an individual upon a community of 
upon a city that is the judgment of God, the wrath of God, that they shall be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, listen to this, and shouldest destroy them that destroy the earth. The wrath of God is to bring destruction, devastation upon the people that destroy the creation of God, that destroy the people by their action, by their influence, by their teaching, by their error, by their occultism, by their satanic work. They destroy the people on earth that God had created. And so the wrath of God comes upon them at the time that he will destroy those people that destroyed the earth. It tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 15. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 15. Remember, we're talking about the retribution. That is, what these people sowed is what they are reaping. And the result of their action is what comes upon them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, who both killed the Lord Jesus. You know, when they killed him, they said, let his blood come upon us. The wrath of God now is going to be on them. That's retribution. And they killed their own prophets. The prophets were the servants of God, calling them out of their sin, out of their evil, and they killed those prophets. They silenced the prophets. That's why the wrath of God is coming, and they have persecuted us. The apostles, they have persecuted us, the proclaimers of the gospel, the good news, and they please not God. That's why that wrath of God is coming they please not God and are contrary to all men. They walk against the salvation of men. They walk against the, the profit of all men. They walk against the possibility of people getting to heaven. They stand in the way and they said you must follow the tradition. The tradition that does not save. You must follow the religion. The religion that does not save and if anyone is going to go the way of salvation and the way of the Lord, they block that way and they receive the way of salvation. They are contrary to all men. In verse 16, it tells us, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. They say, stay here and be preaching to us. But if, if those prophets and apostles, if they preach the truth, they will kill them. They'll persecute them. They'll get rid of them. They'll silence them. They say, stay here, tell us error. Stay here and tell us modified uh, message. We're not going to accept if you preach the true message, okay. If you're not going to accept, we go to the Gentiles and preach unto them the word of life eternal. Before they get there, they go to double cross them and they forbid them to preach the word of life unto the Gentiles that those Gentiles might be saved to fill up their sins always. Look at this, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. That's why the wrath of God comes. The recipients now, number three, the recipients of God's wrath. Who are the people that will receive the wrath of God? The children of disobedience and the people that will not follow the way of righteousness and the people that will hinder the preachers from preaching the word of life and the word of salvation to the people that need be saved. Now in Revelation chapter 6, reading from verse 15. Revelation chapter 6, we're reading from verse 15. 
the, recip the recipients of God's wrath. In Revelation chapter 6, reading from verse 15, and the king, the kings of the earth, those are the recipients, and the great men, those are the people, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, every bond man, and every free man, hid themselves in the days and in the rocks of the mountains. Look at verse 16. It says, and they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath now will come. They were not afraid before they said, if everyone is going to fall, it's going to fall on everyone. Let whatever will happen, happen. And now, as the wrath began to fall upon them, they cried out. And they were seeking hiding places. And there was no place of refuge. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. And then in verse 17, it says in verse 17, for the great day of his wrath is come. The great day, the day of judgment, the day of doom, the day of darkness, the day of devastation, and the day of destroying those who have destroyed the people that lived on earth. They said the day of his wrath is now come, and who shall be able to stand? Well, the reason why that wrath is coming upon them, let's look at some two. We're looking at Psalm 2, reading from verse 1. In Psalm 2, reading from verse 1, it talks about the people of this world. Why do the hidden rage and the people imagine a vain thing, a vain thing? They are going to fight against the Almighty. They're going to resist the Almighty. They're going to stop the coming of the judgment of the Almighty. They imagined a vain thing. Look at verse 2. In but so it says, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's why the wrath is coming upon them. That's why the wrath eventually will fall upon them because they set themselves. It's like somebody set his mind. He set his face like a fleet. And he says, we're going to oppose that God, the God of righteousness, the God of love, and the God of holiness, and the God of mercy, and the God of salvation. We are not going to allow his salvation, his righteousness, to take root in this place. Anyone that comes and he preaches that holiness of God and that righteousness of God, we're going to wipe them out. They sense themselves as if that is their full-time employment image that they come to fulfill on the earth. They leave all their jobs. They leave everything they should have been doing. And they said, this is what we're going to stamp out of this community. Those kings and those leaders and those rulers of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying. In verse 3, what are they saying? Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. The cords of love that is trying to draw them and attract them into the salvation of the Lord. They said, we're going to break that. And all their cords that are trying to uh, attract us, we're going to reject everything. Verse 4, verse 4 says, He that seated in the heavens shall love. The Lord shall have them in derision. In verse 5, it says, in verse 5, then shall you speak unto them in Israel. But you know why? They rejected God. They were adamant. They set their mind. They want to break the cord of God. And they say, we're not going to listen to God. Let him send the prophets. We don't accept. Let him send his only begotten son. We don't accept. And because they reject 
all the overtures of God, all the advances of God, and all the invitations of God to bring them into salvation and to bring them into righteousness. Because they reject that, it says the Lord himself will speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Look at verse 6. In verse 6 it says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Whatever those kings do, whatever those rulers do, the Lord will come at the appointed time and everything that has been ordained that he will do, he will do because in spite of those rulers, in spite of those kings, in spite of those persecutors, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. In verse 7, it says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Verse 10. Verse 10 says, be wise now, therefore. There's still chance to repent. Be wise now, therefore. Wrath is coming at a great speed. And if you do not uh, give yourself to the Lord, you'll not be able to reverse that. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. In verse 11, it says, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Verse 12 says, Kiss the son, love the son, embrace the son, give yourself to the son, be a bride to the son, let him be your bridegroom, let him be your redeemer, have fellowship and intimacy and faith in the son, kiss the son, lest he be angry. Lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. When his wrath is kindled but a little. But blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Why are they blessed? Because if we put our trust in him, our faith in him, we're going to escape every form of wrath. Wrath now, wrath tomorrow, wrath in the great tribulation, wrath after the great tribulation, we escape in Jesus' name. I escape in Jesus' name. You are blessed. I said you are blessed. As you put your trust in the Lord, whatever he then say, whatever Gentiles say, whatever religious people say, you say, I've made up my mind, I have trust in the Lord, faith in the Lord, he is my savior, there's no other savior, he is my redeemer, there's no other redeemer, he is my refuge, there is no other refuge, and because you put that trust in the Lord, and you're unshakable, and you are immovable that blessedness of the lord will be upon your life now and forever in jesus name let's come to point number two now point number two is the glorious redemption from the wrath of God. The glorious redemption from the wrath of God. We're coming to Revelation chapter 15 and we're reading from verses 2 and 3. Revelation chapter 15 verses 2 and 3. And I saw a it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast. Them that had gotten the victory over the beast. Think about this. At the time of the great tribulation, they had built the Antichrist, and then there'll be the false prophet, there'll be the beast, and the beast will go around saying, 
if you're going to buy or sell in the market you must take the mark of the beast and once anyone takes that mark it's done it's doomed it's done forever and there are people at that time there'll be people at that time that will say hunger or no hunger persecution or no persecution and the fury of the antichrist and the wrath of the antichrist all that put together i will not take that mark i will not take that mark and they will endure and whatever comes they'll be victorious the point is if they can be victorious at that time today you'll be victorious we can be victorious today any beast that comes and then wants to push us away from the center of the wheel of the kingdom of God will say, this is not even great tribulation yet. Maybe it's a little trouble, a little tribulation, a little trial, a little temptation. If those people who are going to live at the time of the great tribulation, if they will escape the wrath, I'm telling you today, you'll escape that wrath so we talk about these people and you say they had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name and they stand on the sea of glass having the halves to sing unto the lord in their hands and then in verse 3 he tells us and they sing the song of moses the servant of God and the son of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous at thy works. Great and marvelous at thy works. I'm telling you, these are the people at the time of the great tribulation, and they'll have the victory, and they will sing. In the time of the great tribulation, they will sing. Whatever your trials today, you can sing. Whatever the temptation today, you can sing. And whatever the power of the enemy today, you will sing all your troubles away in Jesus' name. And their song is this, that great and marvelous are thy works, O God, almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Thou King of saints. The people that will escape the wrath are the people who are saints and they bring themselves under the kingly royalty of the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, got in supremacy, granted supremacy over the beast. Granted, got in supremacy over the beast number two glorious songs of triumph of triumphant believers the believers they sing their hearts out and it's the glorious song of triumphant believers number three god's sovereignty in transcendent boundlessness god's sovereignty in transcendent boundlessness you cannot limit god that's why they say great is our god marvelous is, uh, is the, our god and his works are great and marvelous he is the lord he is god almighty he is just and true and his ways are just and truth and he is the king of saints let's look at number one number one got in supremacy over the beast and look at um, the word of god as it tells us in uh, revelation chapter 20 we're looking at verse 4 revelation chapter 20 and we're reading from verse 4 it tells us in revelation chapter 20 verse 4 and i saw thrones and they sat upon them they the believers they the overcomers they the people that have the victory it says they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them and i saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the for the witness of jesus at that time there will be people who will even risk being beheaded for the lord jesus christ at this time now it's not so serious like that and if those people can have the victory and they got a the triumphant victory over the antichrist at that time you will stand today 
I will stand today. And great will be our victory, triumph, and joy in Jesus' name. And he says, and for the word of God, standing for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast with all the threats, and with all the opposition, and with all the pressure, they said, no, you are not going to force me to worship the Antichrist, and I will pay the price not to worship that Antichrist. You know, there are people that will say, I didn't want to do it, but they forced me to do it. I didn't want to do it, but they pushed me into doing it. You see, those people, they don't have their mind, and they don't have a mind of their own. They don't have a strength of their own. They don't have a decision of their own. Even at the time, of the great tribulation there are people that will say whatever the antichrist is going to do whatever the beast is going to do here i stand i will not compromise if the grace will be so much upon those people at that time god's grace is sufficient for you today i said god's grace is sufficient for you today and then it says they will not worship the beast neither his image neither would they receive the mark upon their forehead or in their hands and they lived and reigned with christ a thousand years you reign with christ as you stand and you keep on standing when that time comes you will reign in jesus name and look at verse 6 in verse 6 here is what he tells us blessed and holy is he that has part in the false resurrection on such the second death hath no power but they shall be priests of god and of christ and shall reign with him and shall reign with him and shall reign with him a thousand years in the millennial reign you'll have a crown on your head there'll be stars in your crown joy and happiness and glory and singing forever and ever in jesus name let's come to number two now number two is the glorious song of triumphant believers we're coming to revelation chapter 15 the first part of verse 3 revelation chapter 15 verse 3 and the singer the song of moses the servant of god and the song of the lamb the singer the song of moses and the singer the song of the lamb was the song of moses exodus chapter 15 reading from verse 1 exodus chapter 15 reading from verse 1 then sang moses and the children of Israel they sung unto the Lord. Uh, they had escaped all the death that came on the firstborns in uh, Egypt. They had escaped all the fury of Pharaoh. They had escaped all the occultism and the paths of darkness in Egypt. They had escaped the destruction that would have come uh, for them uh, at the brink of the Red Sea. And they came out triumphantly through the Red Sea and now because of that triumph and because of that victory and because Egypt could not destroy them Pharaoh could not destroy them because now they started their journey and they were going to the land of promise that's why now Moses sang and that's why the children of Israel that's why they sang unto the Lord and they speak saying I will sing I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously it says the horse and his rider as he thrown into the sea look at verse 2 in verse 2 it says the lord is my strength that their song and my song and he is become my salvation and he is my god i will prepare him an habitation my father's god i will exalt him look at verse 3 in verse 3 it says the lord is a man of war the lord God is his name look at verse 6 in verse 6 it tells us the right hand O Lord is become glorious in power thy right hand O Lord has dashed in pieces the enemy in verse 7 it tells us and 
in the greatness of thine excellency that's their song the song of moses moses sang and the children of israel that had the victory over pharaoh over those chariots there's a song they were singing in thy greatness in the greatness of thy excellency thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee thou sentest forth thy wrath which consumes them as stubble look at verse 11 in verse 11 who is like unto thee this is their song O lord among the gods who is like thee glorious in holiness fearful in praises doing wonders in verse 13 it says thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed thou hast guided, guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation the last verse there verse 18 the lord shall reign forever and ever in your life the lord shall reign forever and ever anytime you get to a crossroad you will come over to the other side because the lord will reign in every situation of your life forever and ever in jesus name now they also sang the song of the lamb that is the song of our redeemer the messiah revelation chapter 5 we're reading from verse 9 revelation chapter 5 we're reading from verse 9 here is the song to the redeemer it says and the song in your song saying thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for thou as for thou was slain and has redeemed us to god by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation then in verse 10 it says and has made us to our god kings and priests and shall reign on the earth we shall reign on the earth you will reign on the earth in jesus name let's come to number three now number three god's sovereignty in transcend transcendent boundlessness we're coming to revelation chapter 15 and we're reading from verse 3 god's sovereignty in transcendent boundlessness revelation chapter 15 verse 3 and the singer the song of moses and the servant of God and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true at thy ways, thou King of saints. The Lord is the one that is mighty. And because it's God Almighty is going to come and is going to take the believers, the children of God away, will be the bride. He will be the bridegroom, will take part in the marriage supper of the Lamb in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. In Revelation chapter 19, reading from verse 6, it says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah. For the Lord God, omnipotent, reigneth. That's going to be a song at that time. Satan will not reign. Demons will not reign. The world will not reign. Sinners will not reign. Our God will reign. And we will reign with Christ in Jesus' name. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, let us be glad. I'll be there. I said I'll be there. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. Then in verse 8, it says in verse 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. In verse 9, it tells us, And he says unto me, Write, 
blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true saints of God. Look at verse 11. In verse 11 it says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and a righteousness he does judge and make war. Then in verse 12, he tells us his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Verse 13, it says, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called, tell me, the word of God. Who is that? Tell me out aloud. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Verse 15 tells us, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he shall smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of almighty God. Look at him now in verse 16. It says, and he has on his vesture and on his tie a name reaching. Everybody say that name. Won't you go, everybody? It's exalted, and he will be the highest and the most high. And it says his name will be called King of Kings, Lord of Lords. I pray on that day you will not be found missing. Yeah. Say it for yourself. I will not be found missing. You'll be there in Jesus' name. All tears wiped away, all sorrows gone, every suffering gone, sickness gone, and there'll be nothing in the heart, nothing in life that you'll say, why is this happening? Why is this happening? You'll be on the top of the mountain of victory at that time in Jesus' name. And you will see and nothing in this world and nothing coming from the antichrist and nothing coming from the devil will take the song of god away out of your mouth in jesus name point number three now we're coming to point number three is the gracious reversal of the wrath of god the gracious reversal of the wrath of god you know this day is the day of god's love is the day of god's mercy and is the day when anyone can come to the lord and whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved shall be healed shall be delivered shall be protected shall be preserved, shall be strengthened. Today, even the wrath, even if you have done anything that should have attracted the wrath of God upon your life, we can reverse that wrath tonight. Every wrath in your family can be reversed tonight in Jesus' name the gracious reversal of the wrath of God. We're coming to Revelation chapter 15 and we're reading from verse 4. Revelation chapter 15 verse 4, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. You see, when you fear the Lord, when you honor the Lord, when you yield to the Lord, when you surrender to the Lord, that has to reverse the wrath of God. When you say, I will glorify him, my life will glorify him, my actions will glorify him, my plans will glorify him, everything I do will be to the glory of God. That is how you reverse the wrath of God. When you recognize his holiness, 
angels calling holy, 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 and the saints of God, they all refer to him as the only God thou only art holy. When you recognize his holiness and you bend to his holiness and you partake of his holiness, that's how you reverse that wrath of God. And it says, for all nations shall come and worship before thee. When you come before the Lord and with all your heart in all sincerity transparently without hiding anything without keeping anything in secret you worship the Lord and then you worship before him and you acknowledge that his judgments are true and right and faithful and manifest that's how you reverse the judgment and the wrath of God the gracious reversal of the wrath of God there are three things we're looking at number one the godly fear of true worshipers the godly fear of true worshipers number two the god glorifying faith of thankful witnesses you have witnessed his love you have witnessed his power you are partaking of his love and of his power and you are thankful and you are grateful and then because of that you have a faith that honors and glorifies the lord number three the great foundation of his worthiness the great foundation of his worthiness let's look at number one number one is the godly fear of true worshipers we're still looking at that revelation chapter 15 and we're reading from verse 4 revelation chapter 15 verse 4 who shall not fear thee O lord and glorify thy name who will be so stubborn who will be so rebellious? Who will be so adamant that he will not fear thee? You see, we read in, J in Jonah chapter 3, the people that said, we're not going to remain in our sin. We're going to fear the Lord. And Jonah went in Jonah chapter 3 verse 4. Jonah chapter 3 verse 4, we're told Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Because of that, fear came in their mind, fear came in their heart, and that fear gripped the heart of the king, and he commanded that all the people in Nineveh should turn from their wicked way, and they should cry mightily unto the Lord. That fear of the Lord, that fear they had, reverential fear, honoring fear the fear that they knew that if god said he will do something he surely must do it made them to repent and god had mercy on them look at verse 10 in verse 10 it says and god saw their works when they feared him and when they yielded to him and when they repented because of the fear of the judgment that will come and god saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them and did it not that's the fear we ought to have for God Hebrews chapter 12 we're reading from verse 28 Hebrews chapter 12 reading from verse 28 it says wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we may serve god acceptably look at this with reverence and godly fear let us have god believers let us serve god children of god let us serve god those who are following after the lord in this new covenant let us serve god acceptably and with reverence and godly fear why because in verse 29 in verse 29 for our god is a consuming fire let's look at number two there number two there is the god glorifying faith of thankful witnesses the people who trust in god the people who believe in god and because of that faith in god they have fear 
you know there are people that do not understand that fear for god and faith in god that they go together that when you have the fear of god it makes you to have implicit faith in god and that honors god and glorifies god hebrews chapter 11 verse 7 hebrews chapter 11 we're reading from verse 7 look at this by faith noah being warned of god of those of things not seen as yet moved with fear those two things faith by faith noah and because he believed god a flood is coming and nobody had ever seen any flood that will devastate the whole earth that will swallow up a deluge a great flood that will bring judgment upon the earth when god told noah he feared god but that fear made him to trust God and all that God told him to do, he did so that he will escape the judgment of God. If you have godly fear, you have God glorifying faith. If you fear God like you ought to fear him, if you fear that whatever threats and whatever judgment God has said is going to bring for those who do all these evil things, if you fear God, you have faith in God and you turn away from all those evil things by faith Noah being warned of God as the of things not seen as yet moved with fear prepared an ark to the saving of his house but by the which he condemned the world the world of unbelievers and he became an heir of the righteousness which is by faith at the beginning by faith at the edge by faith and within that bracket of by faith by faith he moved with fear and he did what god said he should do and he escaped the judgment that came in his own generation as you fear god that all that god said will happen will happen great tribulation will come the antichrist will come he'll force people and it will be a terrible thing at that time you believe you have faith and you move with fear and you will not do anything that will make you miss the rapture god will honor your faith and you will escape on the final day in jesus name Galatians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. What that means is since I heard the warning of God and the wrath to come, the thing in me, that is the self in me, that will have gone here and gone there, that will be careless, that will be evil, that will be sinful, that will uh, continue in that inbred sin. Now that I hear the warning of the coming judgment, that thing in me that used to stand up and rebel and do what will not please God that thing is now crucified when you fear God you will surrender that evil sin that inbred sin that evil nature you'll surrender it to God it will be crucified and now you will live a life of faith a life that is built on the word of God and when Christ comes you will go with Christ in the rapture in Jesus name I am crucified with Christ. Whatever others do, others may, I will not. Others may, I must not. Others may, I cannot. I have heard what they have not heard. I have seen what they have not seen. I feel what they do not feel. I see the vision coming, the vision of the impending judgment and wrath of God, which they do not see. And because they, do, they don't see what I see, they they don't know what I know. They don't feel what I feel. They can act anyhow. Others may, but I cannot. Because of that, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. 
yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. If Christ liveth in you, he'll tell you the nearness of that coming judgment. He'll tell you, you'll not live in ignorance, you'll not live as if it cannot happen now. Christ is not living in you then. You'll not live as if I can be careless now. Christ is not living in you then. He knows his coming is soon. He knows his coming is imminent. He knows his coming is very near. If he lives in you, he knows that that time of the rapture is very near and the time of the great tribulation will soon follow. If Christ is living in you, you live a life of knowledge, a life of vision, a life that is prepared. You don't want to be careless at any time because that Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God. We don't live by the foolishness of society. The society is foolish. They do this, they do that. What, what else can they do? They do not know about the devastation that is coming, about the wrath that is coming, about the Antichrist that is coming. That's the only way they can live because of the ignorance of their mind. But because Christ has brought revelation unto you and you know that Christ lives in you. You live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Like like no one lived, you are going to live like that. Like Enoch lived, you are going to live that, like that. You live by faith in the great expectation of the coming of the Lord. And when Christ shall come, you will not be dead. You will hear the trumpet sound. You will not be blind. You will see him coming from the air. And then you will go with the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord in Jesus' name. You'll be there. I see you moving on. I said you'll be there. You will not be lost in Jesus' name. Number three now. Number three is the great foundation of his worthiness. The great foundation of his holiness, of his worthiness. We're coming to Revelation chapter 15 and we're reading from verse 4. Revelation chapter 15, we're reading from verse 4. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy. For thou only by nature art holy. Because thou only in action you are holy. Because you consistently, transparently, from time to time, from all eternity until the present time, until the eternity future, for thou only art holy. For thou only art in your nature, in your life, in your action, in your judgment, in everything you do, in your dealing with anyone, in interaction with anyone for thou only art holy that's the foundation of his worthiness that's why he's worthy to judge sinners because he is holy that's why he's able to rebuke that's why he's worthy to rebuke and to correct all sinfulness all transgression all iniquity because thou only art holy he is holy. Look at Revelation chapter 4. We're reading from verse 8. Revelation chapter 4. And we're reading there from verse 8. And the four bees arch each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night. They rest not day or and night saying holy 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 lord god almighty day or night they don't rest they recognize the holiness of god and they exalt the holiness of god and they also reveal the holiness of god they were the angels and the living creatures abiding with the almighty god and they affirm and they confess and they proclaim holy 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 lord god almighty which was and is and is to come 
what's the effect on us when you understand the great foundation of his worthiness when you understand his holiness that cannot be corrupted that cannot be defiled by any sin or anyone or any situation up there or down here what's to be our reaction Isaiah chapter 6 reading from verse 1 in Isaiah chapter 6 reading from verse 1 it says in the year that King Uzziah died I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple look at verse 2 in verse 2 it says above it to the seraphims each of each one had six wings with twain he covered his face and with twain he covered his feet and with twain he did fly look at what they say and what they proclaim in verse 3 and one cried unto another and said holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory look at verse 4 it says in verse 4 and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke in verse 5 isaiah now saw himself because he heard of the holiness of god here is the response of isaiah and here is the request of isaiah and i said who is me for i am undone because i am a man of unclean leaves and i dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves for mine eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. I'm sure you have heard of some people that say they see vision, they receive revelation, and some people even say they've gone to heaven and they've seen the glory of God and they say the streets of gold. Some people say they've gone to hell and they see some people who are there and then as they come back here, they're still the same. There's no repentance as they come back here even though they said they have seen hell they have seen heaven they have seen angels they have seen everything they even say they have seen a brother so and so they saw sister so and so they say they saw some people in hell and they can even name them but as they come back here they still gossip they still slander they don't have the fear of God. They still have filthiness. And when you see their appearance, they are dressing, they are just like anybody that had not seen anything or gone anywhere. They don't have the fear of God. They don't have the fear for the future. Although they say they have seen angels, they saw nothing. Isaiah, when he saw the angels of God and he had them crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. He looked at himself. He said, if I'm like this i cannot be with him with him that is worthy and with him that is holy and with him that is pure and then said i who is me for i am undone because i am a man of unclean lips and i dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for mine eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts verse 6 and then when he confessed like that then flew one of those seraphims on unto me one of those seraphims that were crying holy 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 unto the lord and they wanted him now to match the holiness of god they wanted all the sin all the adamic nature to be burnt away from his heart from his spirit from his life and then flew one of the seraphims unto me having a live coal in his hand which he had taken with tongues from off the altar and then he laid in verse 7 in verse 7 and he laid it upon my mouth and said lo this has taught thy lives and thine iniquity is taken away and thy sin purged when that fire from heaven comes upon your soul upon your spirit upon your lips upon your mouth sin purged everything totally cleared Adamic nature is cancelled and removed and you'll be pure enough 
to have fellowship eternal fellowship with, with the one that is holy holy and holy thrice holy forever holy because all the root of sin has been taken away from your life and the trumpet can sound anytime and when that trumpet sounds the holy God is expecting you over there and with the holiness of God in your heart there's something like a magnet that will magnetize you up and off you are gone I said off you are gone where are you I said off you are gone where are you? I said, off you are gone. Why don't you rise up and say, Lord, anything that will tie me down here, anything that will not, not make me sing the song of redemption, the song of Moses, and the song of the Messiah, and the song of the Lamb, anything that will keep me down here, oh Lord, wipe it out of me. Let the fire come from the altar of God and burn everything unclean, everything unrighteous, everything Thing that is transgressing anything of iniquity let everything be burnt out of my life so that on that glorious day I will be with the Lord in glory and then like now you serve the Lord who will go for us who is for us and will go for us and then I said here am I Lord send me he wants to make use of you like never before why don't you commit yourself to the Lord and say Lord I'm ready Lord I'm available I'm going to serve you in holiness and righteousness every day of my life all the days of my life let the power of God come upon you and let the purging of the Lord come upon you let the fire from the altar of God come upon your soul and make you as holy as righteous and make you as qualified that even if the rapture will happen at any time you'll not be left behind you will go with the saints of god when those saints go marching in with the lord you will be with them open your mouth talk to the lord in prayer